Well, good evening, everyone. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this official launch of the Institute for the Future of Business. A partnership between the University of Melbourne, Melbourne Business School, and AIA Australia. We're hoping to welcome other partners as well to the partnership as that develops. But it's a terrific opportunity tonight to be able to really celebrate what was for Paul Kaufman and I, my co-dean, wherever Paul is, there he is right there, uh, was uh, an idea, a gem of an idea, germ of an idea, I should say, that uh, we hatched up at the prompting of our Vice-Chancellor uh, some years back to be able to be here this evening. Uh, the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Duncan Maskell, is an apology, lady had an invitation to Government House, so we got sort of gazumped. Uh, but we have uh, the Pro Vice-Chancellor, Professor Mark Hargraves, in his place, and I'll introduce Mark in a moment. But uh, Duncan, as Mark assured me, is uh, very excited about this. It was an idea, as I say, that uh, Paul and I hatched at his prompting, and to be able to be here this evening in this wonderful facility to kick it off and officially launch it is a great privilege. So my name's Ian Harper. I'm the Dean of Melbourne Business School. Uh, and it is my privilege to welcome everyone here tonight on behalf of myself and my co-dean, Professor Paul Kaufman, the Dean of the Faculty of Business and Economics. Before we get down to other business, uh, it's also wonderful to be able to welcome tonight uh, a representative of the Wurundjeri uh, in Stacey Piper and her daughter. And uh, Stacey has agreed to come and give us a welcome to country this evening. Uh, and we also thank her daughter, who would normally be having her dinner at this time, uh, who allowed Mum to come and give us a welcome to country. So in a moment, I'll invite St Stacey to address us. And then when Stacey has given us her welcome to country, um, as I say, Professor Mark Hargraves, who's the Pro Vice-Chancellor for Research Partnerships and Infrastructure, will come up and say a few words about the Institute. Stacey. Thank you very much. In the Woiwurrung language, we say Nungodjin. That means thank you. Balatun Yang Wang Arts, Nadanik Stacey, Wadanjeri Willamik, Wadanjeri Balakut, Bajaja Orang by Nulay and Morang, Mundanai Munok Gulada Bidarang, Mundanai Liwik Bulok Nugulik, Mundanai Willambik, Mundanai Tarangalpik, Wuruwurupik, Murnmutpik, Ma Banyabik, Big Dui Babikut, Ba Mundanai. Faculty of Business and Economics. <laughs> ba Muntanai, Bububs, Ba Burais, Ba Kidab. So that's a little quick acknowledgement in the Woiwurrung language. And I always start with language because um, my, well, we haven't had fluent speakers in our family since my great great grandmother, Granny Jemima Wanden, who was, um, who resided on Corrandirk Mission. And um, then obviously following that, my great-grandmother and my grandmother. So my mum's mum was born on Corrandirk Mission. And um, yeah, we've, we've been in the process of waking up this language for a couple of generations. And um, I share it because it's, it's, you know, a form of resistance in a way, but it's also for me a way to um, heal backwards because, you know, they, they miss that, but I feel like the transgenerational trauma or knowledge that we're bringing can also heal backwards. That's my philosophy. <laughs> um, so I acknowledged first country. I acknowledged the Bidarang, which is the Yarra River. Um, I acknowledged my ancestors, the Liwik. I acknowledged my elders and Ani Dai, who was meant to be here tonight. Um, I've stepped in on her behalf and it's my role as the upcoming generation to step into this space and um, use, utilise these platforms to share our cultural knowledge and our values. Um, and so particularly with evenings or early mornings, I've put my hand up to sort of step in and help. And it's good for me because, you know, I am, I don't, we don't like the word emerging. I'm not an emerging elder by any means, um, but I'm definitely stepping into that older um, space. So um, I acknowledge the six layers of country. I'm not sure if many of you have seen the Jitty Jitty dances, but we dance the layers of country. Um, I won't go through them because I'll talk too long. <laughs> but it basically connects us to the layers of country and also the values linked, linked to that. We have a very amazing, deep and complex value system. Um, 
I also acknowledged, obviously, the Faculty of Business and Economics for inviting us here for your event, launching the initiative of the future of business. And um, it sounds incredible. I've had a little skim read, uh, you know, very little, but obviously bringing academics and industry um, representatives or experts together. And yeah, I think it's a great um, initiative. And obviously for me seeing, I always try to apply my own thoughts to different spaces. And I think for me seeing the growth and expansion of Aboriginal businesses and the Aboriginal economy, um, you know, I think it's great if we did the same in that sense, <clears throat> only because for us, academia has been something that we've been playing catch up on. Um, my mum was 19. So my man was born on Corridor Commission and my mum and her uh, siblings, who were also Irish, because my nan met a beautiful Irishman who uh, was in the Air Force and had 16 kids. <laughs> And um, they lived and grew up, you know, pretty simple and easy life in Hillsville. But um, the, by the 1967 referendum, um, my mum was 19, so the education and um, health policies hadn't, you know, kicked in yet. Prior to 1967, they were managed by the Department of Environment and Wildlife, hence the Flora and Fauna Act, which, you know, is not an actual act as such if you come across that, but it was a lived experience. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I actually just handed in my master's at Melbourne University um, in the Melbourne Graduate School of Education under the Atlantic Fellows of Social Equity. So I'm off to Oxford in July. It's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, it's really interesting to... I've been writing about nation building for... Well, I think I started really big for Aboriginal people and wanted to solve the problems of the world, but obviously it came in the end back down to just nation building for Wurundjeri people um, and what that looks like. So um, I think there's great work being done at Melbourne Uni for our, not just Wurundjeri mob, but for any mob who calls Melbourne home, but also for country. You know, I love the work that's been done and the values that have been embedded into the architecture of Melbourne University and the respect that's given through the walks. Um, yeah, it honours our family because it is, it's our family. You know, we are direct descendants of these people and um, it's, yeah, I think a long-running relationship that we've had for many generations. So for me to stand here and hopefully continue that relationship into the next generation... Um, You'll be part of the business and economics faculty, won't you? <laughs> it's a bit of a way to go. But, um, yeah, I, I, and on that note, I did acknowledge the Bulbups and Burais, which are our future leaders, our next generation. So um, I'll leave it there. I can talk a lot. But um, Wamenji Kao, Wurundjeri Balak, Yemen Kundi Big, welcome to Wurundjeri Country. And I hope you, I hope this evening is productive and into the future this initi initiative just brings all the outcomes that you're looking for. Nungodjan. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stacey, and thanks everyone for having me. Um, Duncan Maskell does send his apologies. Um, he was called away at rather short notice. He was planning to be here and leave a, uh, a little bit later, but um, the itinerary changed, so he does send his apologies. and. Um, he's a microbiologist by training and did an industry internship as part of his PhD and has spun out a, a few companies. So has a commitment to the connection between academia and industry. So, um, and I do have some of his notes, some of which I'll use and some I'll ad lib a little. Um, um, I begin by acknowledging Stacey and all of the traditional owners of the unceded land on which we work, learn and live. Uh, the university is grateful to the traditional owners and elders and knowledge holders of all Indigenous nations and clans who have been instrumental in our reconciliation journey. The university recognises the unique place held by our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the original owners and custodians of the lands and waterways across the Australian continent, with histories of continuous connection dating back more than 60,000 years. And we pay respects to elders past, present and future and acknowledge the importance of Indigenous knowledge in the academy. And Stacey, congratulations on um, Jim McCluskey, my boss, is uh, heavily involved in the AFSI program and uh, well done on, uh, on um, being accepted. 
which is very competitive, the entry, and, uh, and completing. I'm sure you'll love a trip to Oxford, so well done. Um, I'd also acknowledge you know, colleagues from the university, from the Melbourne Business School and the wider community uh, who are here tonight. Um, particularly acknowledge the board members of the Faculty of Business and Economics and the Melbourne Business School um, and the leadership, Professor Ian Harp, Professor Paul Kaufman and Professor Phil Dolan, the Executive Director of the Institute for Future Business. So welcome to you all. Um, and many members of the senior leadership team of the, of the, the business school and the faculty who have been involved in this, um, bringing this together. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank from AI, Alison McLean, the General Manager of Shared Value Partnerships and Damien Moo, the CEO. Um, I'm trained as a physiologist with an interest in exercise and promoting healthy lifestyles and AI, of course, use a number of prominent women sports, uh, prominent uh, sports women to promote that message. Um, I'd also like to thank from NAB, uh, Anthony Burrows, who's the Head of Innovation, and David Gould, the Group Executive for Corporate and Institutional Banking. And my late father worked for the National Australia Bank for 40 years, started as a teller in regional Queensland, did a bit of IT training at uh, QIT, as it was called back then, and moved to Melbourne in 1970 to, as a systems analyst to work on the first ATM network that NAB had. And then he retired um, in the mid-90s, early 90s, as general manager for Treasury Information Systems at 500 Burke. And, um, I'm not sure what he'd make of chat GPT and um, uh, digital um, transformation of banking, which is certainly, I think, the banking sector has um, pioneered many of the digital. Um, and so Melbourne Connect, where you are, is emblematic of the university's commitment to um, foster education, and we make impact through our graduates, and uh, many of them will come and work, work with you and, and, and your fellow businesses but also through the research that we do and the generation and the curation of that, of that knowledge. And so Melbourne Connect is a specific project to bring our academic research teams together with industry partners. And so the Institute for Future Business is another expression of that ambition to connect our academics, many of whom have wonderful f solutions for problems you don't have, at least not at the moment, but you might have them in 20 or 30 or 40 years. And the academic research that underpins that knowledge is, is important. But there are some more immediate problems and the conversations that are curated between industry partners and the academy are important in catalyzing those research, those breakthroughs. So Melbourne Connect, as I said, is emblematic of that. And we have a number of industry partners who have tenancies here, a, a co-working space, um, our Melbourne Entrepreneurial Centre that's been strongly supported by the Faculty of Business and Economics for a number of years, um, our accelerator program, Translating Research at Melbourne, and the Institute for Future Business, at least initially, is going to be located in this ecosystem and we look forward to growing, growing that um, opportunity. So on behalf of Duncan, I, and as I said, he's committed to um, the university working um, very uh, strongly with industry partners. The fundamentals of any partnership are that you can do things together that neither of you can do on your own. And the expertise and insights that come from the business sector will inform our academy. And there are emerging issues. We've mentioned health and wellbeing, digital disruption, sustainability in business, I think, is a big area. And we've got considerable expertise. How we deal with pandemics, we saw the, the debate between is it the economy, is it the health? Well, it has to be both. Um, and there's expertise within the university that can help our business partners um, maximise your shareholder value, but also uh, maintain the commitment to the people in the communities in which you operate and serve. And I think that's to our mutual benefit. So congratulations, Ian and Paul um, and Phil on the Institute of Future Business. We look forward to seeing it grow and succeed. Uh, you have the university's full support. Um, and I can say that, and Duncan will give you all the money you need. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I look forward to hearing the fireside chat, and um, my apologies, I can't stay for dinner, but I look forward to hearing the conversation over the next 45 minutes or so. So thank you for your support, everyone. Thanks.
Mark, for those kind remarks, and thank you again for stepping in at short notice. We appreciate it. If I could invite the panellists to come up onto the dais for our fireside chat. We're uh, going to spend a little time now uh, with our panellists discussing the proposition, what is the value uh, for academic and industry collaboration? What do we get out of academic industry collaboration? And uh, we'll be having the panel facilitated by our new executive director, whom I'll introduce in a moment, but let me begin by introducing the other members of the panel first, uh, beginning with Damien Moo. Damien has been the Chief Executive Officer of AIA Australia since 2014. He has more than 20 years experience in the Australian financial services industry and he's passionate about leading a purpose-led organisation. Also passionate about the AFL as you can see and maybe <laughs> coming off second best. Uh, he's uh, an advisory board member of the Shared Value Project, a peak body that empowers businesses to rethink the relationship between profit and purpose. Damien, thank you for coming this evening and being part of our panel. Our next panellist is David Gall on the far, my far right there. David is a member of the executive leadership team at the National Australia Bank uh, as its group executive, corporate and institutional banking. David has 33 years of experience in corporate and retail banking, uh, working in capital services, in risk and in payments. And David is a senior fellow of the Financial Services Institute of Australasia, or FINSIA. Thank you, David, for coming down, especially given that the NAB was having a town hall tonight and you had to rush out, but we really appreciate that. Uh, third panellist is uh, my colleague, Professor Caron Beaton-Wells, who's the Dean Internal at Melbourne Business School. Uh, Caron is also a professorial fellow of the Melbourne Law School and an internationally distinguished and multi-awarded academic leader. She's a competition lawyer of international distinction. Uh, Karon is a member of the Chief Executive Women, Australia's peak, or, peak organisation for influencing business and government to achieve gender equity. And I'm delighted that karon has been available tonight to be on our panel. And finally, of course, moderated by Professor Phil Dolan, the inaugural director, executive director of the Institute for the Future of Business. Phil comes to us with over 30 years experience in academia and industry, including senior leadership roles at Macquarie University, the University of Western Australia Business School and La Trobe University. He's also worked in investment related roles at Macquarie Bank over 13 years and has managed his own investment company and is now a keen investor in a range of Australian startups. So Phil, whom I've known uh, for some years now, brings exactly the mix uh, of skills we were looking for in an executive director, somebody who's been successful in both business and academic life, uh, and in my humble opinion, uh, ideal to take our idea, balls and my idea, and breathe life into it. So with that, I'm going to hand over to the very same Professor Dolan to be the facilitator of our fireside chat. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Um, yeah, uh, we certainly look forward to hearing um, insights that you've got to share uh, from both sides of the table, as it were, in academia and in, in industry. I wonder if I could start by asking uh, Damien and David. Um, there are a number of critical issues that business is dealing with at the moment, uh, climate, cybersecurity, a range of them that, that uh, all organisations are grappling with. Uh, if you could perhaps share with us what you see as a couple of the most important ones from the perspective of your organisation, uh, and then how you think collaborating with the university would be a way to address those. Please. Perhaps start with David. Yeah, no, sure. Um, hi, everyone, and uh, fantastic to see so many familiar faces, but uh, certainly to the AIA folks in the room who I've only just met a few uh, tonight. Um, great to meet a few of you, and I look forward to saying hello a little later on. I'd just like to also acknowledge Stacey. That's the third time I've heard her provide a welcome, or actually, I should say, an acknowledgement of country. And um, I just learn so much every single time. She is so impressive and I think a very impressive um, leader. So just, she may well have gone, but I just wanted to uh, acknowledge her. And I, I think that link that she brought to academia as well was absolutely fantastic. There's probably a, a couple of things that, um, just to answer your question, Phil, that I just sort of kick off with. And, and the first one is, you know, probably one of the biggest issues, challenges that we see 
our clients facing into, that we're having to face into ourselves, and society more broadly is having to face into, and that's climate transition. And uh, we've already had an opportunity to partner with MBS around helping to lift the capability of the bankers that we've got on our team to have better quality conversations with our clients. And I've got to say, even for quite a short program, but actually co-designing something with a bit of rigour to it um, has made an enormous difference and had very quick impact on those quality of conversations, uh, co conversations with our clients. And it certainly has, I suppose, opened my eyes to the way that partnering with academia, we can actually identify and lift some of the sort of key capabilities that I think can help all of us meet head on some of these sort of, if you like, macro challenges that we're facing in, in the economy, but actually more broadly in society as well. So, so one for me is, is certainly climate change, and I'm keen to explore that more broadly um, and perhaps more rigorously as well, because, you know, if we can get rigour around that now, we're talking about decisions we're making today that are impacting us in the decades to come. You don't have to get it far wrong now to have a massive impact out in 2050. So I just think that that, that is a topic that lends itself well. And, and I think another one for me is in and around um, data and digital. And how do you bring up a level of capability in our own teams? But actually, how do we tap into some of the best brains in the country, if not the world, in terms of augmenting some of our understanding of the opportunities in and around digital and data um, and, and, and really, you know, accelerating and sort of turbocharging that as well. So if I was to pick on a couple of areas, I, I just think those are the top two that come to mind at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Damien? Thank you. Um, well, firstly, a uh, privilege and a pleasure to be here tonight with all of you and uh, to be partnering with the uh, Melbourne University and Melbourne Business School on this fantastic initiative. Um, I think, you know, f for me, yes, I was going to say, well, how long have you got? Because there's lots of problems we're trying to solve uh, and many that we think we'll be better together through this partnership by bringing the best of um, both organisations and that, that academia and that business uh, knowledge together to create what we call shared value outcomes for, for our business and for society where we're really looking at what we do as a business and how that intersects to solve those societal issues. Um, so, you know, there are a range that I would love to talk about, um, many that we're tr struggling to prioritise right now when you think of uh, coming out of the back of COVID, whether it's in our own business or whether it's more broadly in society. But ultimately, if I was to pick a couple that we, we want to focus in on, yes, absolutely, um, climate's there. But I think for us, it's how do we tackle this, uh, this economic issue that's facing us daily around one that we can't meet around the demand supply issue around the health and wellbeing of our nation. And so when we look at that, unfortunately, the trends are going the wrong way. And uh, we've been very good at sort of looking at treatment, but if we're going to ultimately reverse the trend and if we're ultimately going to try and deal to that, you know, economic supply demand issue, then we've got to get into prevention and, and start to get people engaged in their taking ownership around their health and wellbeing. And that's going to require a significant amount of research and collaboration because while we know it's rational, we know that uh, government and others need the data to substantiate um, investment into those areas. So yes, a lot of money goes into treatment and we shouldn't stop that, but we've got to start putting some funds into getting the fence at the top of the hill as well to try and help prevent that. And we know the success we've had so to date when we are able to look at how we can um, bring, bring that data to bear through understanding that there are true economic and social impacts that can be happening by having people make small changes around um, their health and wellbeing, you know, whether that's both physical and mental and the environment. You know, um, uh, when we look at the uh, nearly a quarter of deaths around the world are as a result of environmental impacts. So we think about this as the, the climate change and other things as future generations happening right now. Right? And we, we don't understand that two thirds of the deaths that are happening today are a result of environmental impacts here in Australia. So how do we bring that research to bear so that we can help people bring it into the now because of the behavioural economic impact of the present bias is there, right? So we've got to bring those future issues into the now and help people to feel a sense of responsibility for not just future generations, which is really important, but the current one. 
So we look at really thinking about how we can collaborate to build more around the model of the 5590, which is the five modifiable lifestyle behaviours that lead to five of the non-communicable diseases that lead to 90% of deaths in Australia, 63% of deaths worldwide. Now that's a message of hope for us because it's actually uh, lifestyle choices. So what we want to be able to do is work together to think how do we bring um, a, a mindset shift, a behavioural economics, behavioural science to helping people to make those small changes across those lifestyle behaviours and fundamentally deliver on the dream grounded in fact of Australia being the healthiest nation in the world. There's nothing that can stop us if we really set our mind to it, but it will only happen through collaborations like this where we can bring the head and the heart um, the data and the um, and the, the vision together. So I'm looking to number one do that together, um, and um, and then have our role in terms of the you know how we look at driving um, a better environment and climate. But the second one I think for me is more an intrinsic, fundamental issue um, that is you know so I think about what are the systemic issues that are or systemic causes for some of the issues we have today. And you know what we find in a, in a, is a, a confusing situation around why are people not engaged in their own financial well-being. Why in Australia do we have a very uh, uh, passive society when it comes to taking ownership around their own financial well-being? And when you break that down, it's because we just haven't been. You know, we, we we're actually very blessed. So we have great economic structures, you know, when you think about us, uh, Medicare and, um, Medic you know, comparably across global sent, you know, social security system, a superannuation system that means you come out of work and suddenly 10% of your money is saved for you, 9.5% saved for you. So what we have to do is recognise that those are there, but then how do we overcome that inertia, over overcome that complacency to really take what is a rational conversation and create that emotional connection so that people act and start to take ownership for their own financial wellbeing and outcomes and engage. Um, so, you know, we think that by working together, and I want to give a big shout out to Alison, who you mentioned earlier, and to our team um, who are passionate about driving this partnership so that we can deliver on, 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 on solving some of these big societal issues. And I think it's business's responsibility um, and as leaders, uh, our responsibility, uh, not just to be sitting here and having the privilege to talk about these things, but be doing something active about it. So we really are here to celebrate the fact that we've now got a call to action that we need to deliver on. Thank you. Uh, well, given what we just heard, Kwan, uh, and your knowledge of what the university's good at, uh, could I perhaps ask for your thoughts on ways from the university point of view that we could assist with dealing with some of the issues that have been raised? Oh, thank you, Phil. And let me first just pay tribute to, to Ian and Paul. When I joined the business school, the Institute for the Future of Business was it was a twinkle in their, in their eyes. And here we are uh, just a few years later with it brought to fruition. And we pay tribute too to AIA and, and to, to NAB for really sharing in this magnificent uh, vision. It's a, it is a sheer joy and with great pride that I'm joining the panel tonight. Um, I want to just make some contextual observations, Phil, if I can, before getting directly to your question. Observations about the role and the nature of the higher education sector in Australia's research landscape. Um, because this may not be well known beyond the walls of universities, but in fact, we're incredibly lucky in Australia to have such high quality research coming out from our universities um, as a sector. Our university research contributes to 36% of the nation's R&D expenditure and universities spent um, some 13 billion on their research output uh, in 2020. So it's a very significant contributor. Um, but the, the, the richness and the impact of its contribution does rest to a large extent on the way in which it engages with industry and, and government. I think universities have realized um, for quite some time now that the grand challenges, as we call them, or the wicked problems, um, are by nature ones that require us to transcend traditional disciplinary boundaries. And universities have been committed for many years to promoting and uh, maximising the impact of trans or, or interdisciplinary research. And they've done that very well within their institutions, and they've even done that well across uh, academic institutions, but there's still a lot more to be done 
by um, collaborating with, with this industry and government. And I think the University of Melbourne is an exemplar in that regard. If you think about the research and innovation, innovation precincts that it spawned uh, in recent years, and we sit physically within just one um, tonight, uh, there's a lot to be proud of in the way in which the university has reached out beyond the ivory tower to, to connect with and make its research accessible to industry and to draw industry in to collaborate with it. Um, nevertheless, I think what is um, behind the, the vision of the Institute is the recognition that as a comprehensive research intensive institution with structures and gateways that are unfamiliar to, to the corporate sector and you know difficult to penetrate and engage with, there needs to be a vehicle I and mean, a conscious intent um, and mechanism for, for bringing business in. And, and the Institute is going to provide a front door for that, uh, an obvious, clear front door for businesses to enter into and find their way around the labyrinth that can constitute uh, the university. I mean, the issues that Damien and David have touched on um, are certain issues that we at the Faculty of Business and Economics and the Melbourne Business School are very attuned to, um, that we have research and, and teaching and engagement um, directly uh, pointed at. And I'll just give you a couple of examples in the areas um, that have been touched on tonight. Um, there was mention of, of NAB's work with our Centre for Sustainability and Business. Uh, that's, that's a centre that is only three years old, but it's gone from strength to strength in finding that real niche, understanding that businesses themselves are moving beyond sustainability as a compliance issue into thinking about sustainability as a strategic opportunity for competitive advantage um, and looking for, for help and input from, from the business school and the centre to elevate it into the C-suite and, and to the level of strategy. In the area of data and digital, great example um, of what was touched on here tonight was the, the collaboration that we have with Google and News Corp, recognising that journalism um, as an industry has got a long way to go to, to digitally transform the newsrooms and the media channels of today. So, Working with journalists of about 250 across the country in that partnership is helping us uplift that, that capability for journalism as an industry. So there's a plethora um, of examples um, and the Institute's going to provide the vehicle for, for that type of collaboration. Fantastic. Uh, Damien and David, um, one of the issues that business grapples with perpetually but particularly currently is access to a pipeline of talented employees. Uh, and hiring the right people into the right roles is a constant issue. Uh, and one of the services the Institute will offer to its partners is access to the university students for internships, projects, site visits, potential employment down the track and so on. Um, could you perhaps give us an insight for each of you into the areas in, in, within your own organisations where you are looking to employ people and perhaps finding it tough to get the right people uh, and where and collaboration like this might be able to help. Uh, maybe start with Damien. Okay, well thank you. Um, and uh, look, I, yes, uh, uh, Ian and Paul, it's great to be here today and congratulations for having the passion and, and uh, vision to drive this through. And I remember our first date on Zoom, um, which, is now, which is now in person. So uh, it was great to see where, how that uh, has come to life. But I do also want to acknowledge Petty Yates, our chair, who actually started our partnership, helped us get our partnership with Melbourne University off the ground many, many years ago, because the, the comment about talent is where it started. And we said, why are we not talking to Melbourne University when we are out there looking to bring into the AA family the best talent uh, to be able to help us solve these problems? And that's where it started. And uh, we've had a relationship with Melbourne Business you know, our School for a number of years. And um, our actuarial graduate program is, is alive and well. Um, and we get to, uh, we're the beneficiaries and, and hopefully they are of being able to come out of university into doing meaningful work. So that continues to be strong. But if I was to look beyond that now, um, you know, because we want to continue to nurture that and continue to watch that grow. Um, it is probably in the area of uh, in our in our operations and customer area and our IT area, and 
That's really challenging right now because it's just really about a supply demand issue again to break it down to simple economics. Uh, you know, we've got um, uh, the, the the talent, the, sorry, the the, re the requirements and demand for IT and, and customer uh, operations people right now is so high and uh, the pool of resources are just not there. So, um, you know, if we want to continue to, yes, we, we have no doubt um, we're part of the AA group which is, has who operates in 18 markets across Asia Pacific but you know we want to make sure we continue to um, have a, num a large continue to have the majority of our operations on shore um, and to do that we need to attract great talent and nurture that through so we'll be wanting to look at how we can continue to do that across different um, different uh, faculties and different parts of our organization yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, look I think it, there's there's some obvious areas and um, you know, aligned with some of the sort of technical capabilities that we might like to be able to source, and it could be digital and data uh, experts, uh, etc. But there's some areas that are not as um, that I think many wouldn't be as familiar with, but are really challenging areas for us, particularly in this current environment. And I think it will be for the next decade, um, and that is areas like uh, financial preventing financial crime. Uh, areas like fighting fraud and scams, which is just becoming such a big issue in society, a big issue for banks, but actually a big issue for us all. Um, as my boss Ross would say, if you don't know who it is calling, just press the red button, hang up. Um, but but tr bringing some of the capability that's possible through students coming through into areas like that and actually solving some of these issues in a very different way, I think could be extremely uh, powerful, certainly around climate, but areas like distributed ledger, some of what we're doing around crypto and how you actually make that, make that uh, safe. Um, and then some of the complementary skills as well, some of the, the human behaviour elements, you know, how do we help really support our clients, particularly vulnerable customers, for example. So I think this is going to be really interesting because some of the obvious candidates initially may well be overtaken by um, the work that we do together to actually find very different ways of solving some much more impactful um, issues, challenges and opportunities for our organisations. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I, I can't remember the last time I watched the evening news when it didn't have a story about some fraud where someone had lost their life savings or been taken advantage of. Um, just t terrible. Um, Coron, from the other side, um, the, the ability for our students to benefit from the insights that they would get from partnership like this and, and, and our faculty in terms of things like curriculum development, case studies, having guest speakers come in, site visits to organisations and so on. Um, perhaps um, from a Dean's perspective, what would we be hoping to get from a partnership like this that would benefit our faculty and our students? Mm. So there's a lot of that flow going on already, um, certainly at the, at the faculty level. Uh, internships or work placements as they're sometimes called, work, work integrated learning in the generic phraseology um, is increasingly recognised by the university and by academic institutions in general as core to a university education. Um, the FBE, for example, have partners with over 100 organisations each year to give their BCom, Bachelor of Commerce students an opportunity to, to do an internship. Uh, that type of learning is uh, built into certainly the MBA and the Master of Business Analytics at the Business School. and. I mean, the benefits are, are incredibly bilateral. So the students go into an organisation, they have an opportunity to um, apply their learning of the theory to a real world problem that actually means something to a business, to interact with the business stakeholders and get their um, perspective on, on the issue. Uh, and then to actually come up with solutions, have to communicate them uh, to, to the business stakeholders uh, and, and see their work actually have, have real value and impact. Um, that is part of, 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 of a you know, modern day university education at the best university 
that the University of Melbourne is. Now, that's happening, um, but I think the Institute has enormous potential to deepen and broaden that kind of interaction. And in an environment that we are, as we all acknowledge today, with severe skills shortages, as I said, it's a very much a mutually uh, beneficial opportunity, not just for the, for the students, but, but for the organisations. I'll just give you one, one example of the benefit for organisations. Um, the Master of Business Analytics, which is a trilingual program bringing together the language and the skills um, of maths, business and computer science, so quintessentially um, interdisciplinary, produces graduates who are in high demand. Uh, and through the Centre for Our Business Analytics, um, they get placed in organisations through an applied subject that they do in the program, and then those, universe, those organisations literally um, tag them uh, and start approaching them before they've even graduated. They are, they are in such competition. So um, I think just a more systematic um, approach to these things by, by the university and by, by industry has huge potential both ways. I think it's interesting because I think it's easy for industry to underestimate the capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, just before lockdown, so in 2019, I was in Shanghai and walked into our office there and met three Melbourne University um, Masters, uh, MBA uh, grads. They weren't quite yet grads, but mm. ju just about. And we had them working on our Chinese Remimbi derivatives license. Yeah. Like this is highly technical <laughs> stuff. Um, and they were absolutely fantastic and really yeah. helped NAB get there on that. And I thought, gee, you know, we're, we're not actually leveraging this anywhere near yeah. to the extent. And y you can actually throw, you know, I think some of these wonderful candidates in the deep end mm. and you might be surprised how well they swim. And let me just give another example to add to that. Um, in, in, in the MBA program as well, we have an incredibly innovative subject called biodesign that puts together faculty of engineering students, MBA students and hospital clinicians. And they work over nine months uh, to develop um, med tech devices to meet emerging clinical needs. And some of these things then go on, um, as have a number of, of the teams coming out of that subject, to, to develop startups that become flourishing success stories. Uh, so it's not just a question of, of our students going on to be placed in organisations, but themselves developing their own businesses that add to the, the Australian economy in, in significant ways. Um, Mark referred earlier to artificial intelligence and chat GPT and so on, the huge uh, potential to impact businesses in all kinds of ways, the kind of things their employees do, the kind of ways you deal with your customers, kind of products and services you might offer. Um, uh, could you get, perhaps give us some insights into the way you're thinking about the potential of these new technologies to impact your firms? And, and areas like if, if they replace the kind of work that's done by entry-level employees, for example, do you need entry-level employees anymore? And if you don't, what's your pipeline for turning people into more senior executives if they haven't come in at that level? So uh, just the impact that technology, artificial intelligence in particular, might be having on each of your businesses, because it's an area that the university is doing a lot of work in as well. But, uh, yeah, and look, I'd lo love to kick off. I, I think this is interesting because I don't think many of us, and certainly I've put myself in that category, really understand the full power of actually what we're dealing with um, here. And so we're all on a bit of a, a learning journey, what's, what's possible. I think, I think it probably has got the oppor you know, opportunity to transform white collar business in a way that maybe it's as big as the industrial revolution. I mean, it, this is, I think, massive. Could it affect their numbers? And that it'll certainly affect the nature of a lot of entry level jobs. But I think that's okay. I think we can embrace that because what excites me a lot about if this thing can be anything like industrial revolution is the productivity that can be driven by this. So it means that we can afford to have, you know, superior skills getting superior rewards, salaries, um, in, a, in, a in a very different Australia um, uh, with a lot of the, the repetitive 
mundane tasks actually taken out. But that's only part of it. I think the other exciting thing is, you know, I sort of uh, liking this term bionic banker. You know, if we're, we're a relationship bank, we want to be known for our relationships. But imagine having a banker that knew everything that they should know about you all the time, up to speed, can research and deliver that insight. That's pretty exciting to me. So it's, it's not just the, the change of, you know, and elimination of some jobs. It's the jobs that will be there are going to be a lot more exciting, uh, both for the customer and, and actually for the colleague, the employee. Can I add to that? I think it throws out a challenge to universities um, in thinking about what our responsibility is to develop uh, the skills in our future graduates for a world yeah. like that. Um, and, you know, this is not, not a new debate, but I think it's being accelerated. And it's the debate about those generic skills of any university graduate, regardless of discipline, that will set them up and equip them for multiple roles, careers, jobs over a lifetime, uh, and then how, how their actual work experience when they get into organisations just seeks to further enrich that. What is our responsibility for, for developing the baseline of those skills that might be cognitive, meta, uh, in, certainly interpersonal, so-called uh, soft skills? Um, and I think universities uh, working more closely uh, with industry will we'll be better equipped to in turn equip the graduates to serve, serve those functions that you describe and I think in a really exciting, exciting way. Um, you know, at the business school we're thinking about what the future of learning in organisations should look like yeah. because a bit, a bit like sustainability, I think, in, in the current environment, learning and development is being elevated into a strategic uh, issue or, or challenge or opportunity. I think if we'd, if we'd asked yeah. Stacey's daughter when she was here, what do you want to be when you grow up, a perfectly valid answer to that question could be a job that doesn't even exist today. Who knows, in 10 years' time, she's eight years old. Um, um, Damien, you seeing in, in yeah, from your Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not very cool with the technology stuff. I'm just going to be out there and be honest about it. Um, but thankfully, we've got an awesomely talented team <laughs> there, um, that I can press a button <laughs> and someone answers. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, so, look, I don't want to claim to be any technology expert, but obviously, yes, this is the area where we can fundamentally transform and um, accelerate what I see. Not, not. I, I don't. I, I don't. I look at it as absolute positive. When you think about that, saying so, you know, a demand supply issue, we can't get to the issues because we've got inefficient processes, inefficient um, customer experiences, technology designs, all those sort of things. So we are absolutely trying to embark on that. It's not an easy one um, for, for financial institutions. Uh, I think the banks have been the leaders in, in, in that area, but for insurance companies that have been around for a couple hundred years with a lot of legacy and a lot of, you know, traditional policies that used to come on what looked like from the Queen's letterhead um, that, that still are stored somewhere. Uh, we've got a fair bit to go. But um, we've been, we've, we, we early on pioneered in the areas of AI where we were able to turn a four hour, five hour process into a minute by te teaching, um, you know, uh, what we used to call Watson you know, at the time, it was IBM Watson, and what, you know, and we'd talk to him and sort of have a chat to him and somehow it would just come out. Um, but um, we were able to demonstrate that that really does work. But the, the reality for me uh, is, you know, I think it, it, isn't, it, it isn't one of fear around we won't have roles. We actually will be able to divert resources into the areas that matter and they will be able to do other jobs because they are then enabled by an environment that, that supports that because they have the digital technology to do it. Um, my only caution is, you know, we, we love the candy. Um, it's a, that's a um, behavioural economic term, just, else, just in case I'm looking at my... Else. We love the candy of the new thing, right? But I just want us to also, without being a wet blanket, think about what is the future generational impact of some of the things we do today. Um, you know, I love the fact that we've been able to bring information at the speed of light that we get now connected as a globe 
I'm not happy that 12 year olds are having mental health issues because they can't keep up with what is an Instagrammable world that they think they need to live on. I don't want to be a dampener on that. I just want us to be really mindful of our responsibility and our pursuit of and our passion and our energy to want to solve because I'm about as energetic as it gets. So don't worry. Um, I want to do everything like yesterday. Um, but I am very mindful that I want us to take the responsibility of what this technology and what this new world can do. I don't want to outsource being a dad to chat GPT. I just don't, sorry. So I want us to be really um, mindful of our responsibility as leaders as we transform the world, create better customer experiences, better outcomes, solve big issues, but don't unintentionally create other ones. So, you know, that's, is that, is that appropriate to say? But um, I don't want to be a damn on it, but, it, you know, that's that's yeah, no, really That's important. very appropriate. Um, we, we have time for a couple of questions, if there are any from the audience. Uh, if you would like to ask a question of the panel, please, yeah. Rubbing mic. Uh, yeah, there's a microphone, so. I can probably speak loud enough. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, my, I'm Michael Trippier I'm from AIA, so Damien is my boss. Uh, so great speech, Damien. Uh, but, um, <laughs> I actually have a question, though, for Karen. Um, on a comment you made about the responsibility of universities to, to ensure that you're training um, people for the the world at large. Um, I've always been interested in the difference between, you know, learning as purely a, you know, learning for learning's sake or as an academic exercise versus, you know, vocational learning. You know, where I have a law degree from my university and I, I really treasure both that it trained me up to be a good lawyer, but obviously lots of learning post-graduation was necessary. But also I remember, you know, some of my favourite subjects were ones I'd never use in, in current life. So I suppose what, how, I guess, how do you, to, to, I guess, balance that out? No, that is a great question, um, and this is a debate going on in the context of the university's accord process, which some uh, in the audience may be aware of, a process kicked off uh, by the Commonwealth Government to really rethink and reimagine the role of universities um, in the Australian economy and society going forward. Um, there's no doubt that universities play a central role in educating, skilling up people for jobs, for roles, to do tasks um, and to have the capabilities for that. But I think the role of universities can and should go well beyond that. And if I was to describe it in a nutshell, um, I think universities should be the place where people learn to learn, uh, but also where they come back over a lifetime to unlearn and relearn. Um, and not just for future careers and roles, I mean, in a utilitarian sense, but for the sheer joy of learning and, and an understanding of, of how that is meaningful from a human growth, human development uh, point of view. Uh, that's what universities offer, um, and that's why they are a public good um, and one that you know, deserves the taxpayer dollar and, and government funding debate going on as well um, about that but for another day so it, it's an excellent question and certainly you know as a mother of a 19 year old who's just started a Bachelor of Arts here and then is trying to plot out what her degree is going to translate into in terms of an income I keep saying to her you're just there to learn for the joy of it so pick the subjects that you're just curious about and everything else will follow Easier said than done, though. I'm not sure she's taking me all that seriously. <laughs> uh, we probably have time for one more question, if there is one. Uh, well, when I was going to say, I would have loved to have experienced Melbourne uh, University, but unfortunately I didn't get the grades. <laughs> <laughs> you can come back. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, Damien, um, I've got a, a colleague who's a family physician in Kaiser Permanente in the US. And they've worked out that they make more money by keeping their members out of their hospitals. And so, you know, they're the insurer and the funder. And, of course, that's what the federal and state governments are in terms of the provider, except in the private sector. So do you, do you imagine you, you mentioned about prevention? Can you see a day where, you know, we can get to that point rather than being forced to in some, some states in America where they have to make rational decisions about the rat the, or the rationing of healthcare because of economic circumstances, but do you, can you see that happening? 
Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely. So we've got a number of programs and what we call them healthcare and um, programs that we've been piloting and now sort of more than beyond pilots. So Pain Revolution is one of those uh, where, you know, by um, looking at how we can help people manage their pain, we can keep them from having to have operations, but getting to hospital. Uh, Kaiser, I know very well, actually. Uh, um, and um, so, yes, we had a pilot with over 2,000 people with chronic severe pain uh, for over two years, went through the program. Um, after the program, 50% of them wanted to return to work. And this was about just helping them to find movement again, doing other things that uh, would actually keep them away from not having to need to have an operation because it wasn't necessary. But in the past, that has been the only option that has been presented. And so I think this is where we're saying how can health and life insurers be more um, relevant to their customers' life early on rather than just waiting to pay for the bill once they've seen a doctor because it's too late and need to have an operation. So absolutely. Um, and, you know, you touched on that exercise physiology is a really important part. When we have our cancer coaching program, um, that's a really important part. There's, you know, people said to me the other day, um, oh, so what, what's the special source? What's the magic source? Well, actually, the first thing is just having a coach that's someone you can talk to. Um, you know, uh, supplemented then by ongoing the ability to have some of that chat, G, chat, chat GPT type technology because not someone's going to be able to bail all the time. But the first part is just having someone to talk to. The second part is then looking at things like their diet, their medication, how we can keep them on their treatment. But exercise physiology and the return to work rates and the recovery rates are huge. So I think, you know, we really want to make this correlation about this isn't about running marathons, but just how important exercise and movement is to stopping and preventing injuries that result in potentially operations or people being unable to work or having to claim on the system to similarly recovering from cancer and being able to get back to work. So we have a fantastic cancer survival rate, but 70% of people who go through cancer don't return back to the workforce. So, you know, sorry, I'm, you, but <laughs> your point is, I do see that society and this is what these types of partnerships will help us enable. Because if we just sort of outsource our responsibility to government to have to come up with all those things, then, you know, it's going to be generations and generations down the track. The NDIS is a great example of how much funding is going to be required and why it's going to be difficult for us to be able to put some of that effort there. So I think collaborations like this enable that to be accelerated. Uh, right. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Well, the way the seating has been arranged, Paul Kaufman and I are both at the front of the room, and so you haven't been able to see the smiles on our faces. Uh, the discussion this evening has brought to life precisely what it was that Paul and I envisaged when we thought about the Institute, that there's just so much scope for this type of interaction between the academy and business. And uh, the institute is here to really supercharge that. It isn't, as Karan has indicated, uh, you know, unique. The university more broadly does this type of thing too. But to have a way in to this conversation for business and in our own area of business and economics to be able to make our contribution to what is done more broadly within the university is what the institute's all about. So would you join me in thanking our panellists this evening, especially Phil, who's convened this so expertly. In a moment, I'm going to ask Professor Rosemary Addis if she would give us some concluding remarks before we have dinner, those who are staying for dinner. Uh, but before I do, there are two people I'd like to name and acknowledge before we go further, and they are my colleagues Celeste Perfect and Vainant Basudenhout. These two have worked together really from the outset and uh, they started out sort of assisting Paul and me in pulling this together and before long they pulled it out of Paul's and my hands <laughs> and ran off with it uh, and it's just so wonderful to see that happen, frankly. Uh, so I want to acknowledge both of you because you've, and I'm sure Paul would agree with me in this, uh, in so many ways you've driven this and your fingerprints are all over tonight and the people who've been involved and the caliber of people we've been having conversations with, um, Anthony and Alison who've been mentioned, but others as well. So thank you to you both. And with that, uh, let me, yes, well, thank you, yes. Uh, let me now introduce Professor Rosemary Addis. Uh, Rosemary is the founding managing partner of 
Mondial Impact, which aims to shape 21st century governance for a sustainable future. Uh, she's also an enterprise professor in impact, sustainability and innovation at the Faculty of Business and Economics, and it's in that capacity that we've invited Rosemary to come and close this evening. Uh, she's known for her extensive global legal career spanning 30 years, as well as lifetime contributions in impact, finance and law. Please welcome Professor Rosemary Addis. Thanks very much, Ian, for that introduction, and, and thanks to all the panellists for uh, thought-provoking discussion. Uh, and it's still only the beginning. Thanks to all of you for joining us here on this beautiful Wurundjeri country, and we were so um, uh, thoughtfully welcomed by, by Stacey. Um, I'm really pleased to have been invited to deliver these closing remarks because I have the great privilege in my work to sit at the intersection of academia and other sectors. Um, I think academia is my sixth professional language. And um, what I've learned is that uh, nobody has a monopoly on good practice. There are lots and lots of things we can learn from others in different areas and that there are good people everywhere when we ask the question, what can we do together? We live in a really extraordinary time, a window of history in the making that does have profound consequences. And we have critical choices ahead, as David was saying about climate change will affect what happens over the, the coming decades. I think of it a little bit of a Dickensian point in time, our 21st century tale of two futures where it's an age of wisdom and an age of foolishness. And to really truncate the Dickens reference, also a season of light and a season of darkness, a winter of despair and a spring of hope. And I hope that hope is what we can tap into through initiatives like this. There's no doubt that the challenges in front of us of the changing climate and the structural and geopolitical issues are manifest and they're polarising and they're politicising. The effects for people and communities are really profound. We've backslid on indicators of social progress against the UN Sustainable Development Goals in the last two years um, for the first time in 30 years. We've seen fault lines opening up in energy and food security and manifest gaps in our health infrastructure and some of the issues that Damien was speaking to. And we've got a post-pandemic workforce, some of whom refuse to snap back and we're seeing rapid technological developments that we've discussed here tonight, some of which conjure up images of genies in bottles, some of which could show great promise. I'd be very happy for my bionic banker to give me a blockchain-enabled one point of truth for KYC. <laughs> some of our current models show no sign yet of being able to solve the global sustainability problems at their roots. We know that the multilaterals and people around the world are telling us that we're not making fast enough or good enough progress. And in fact, that some of the limitations of the way we do business in our current institutional governance have been slow to adapt and may not adapt quickly enough. So if that plants a we are here flag in the landscape, the more positive and hopeful part of that is that also never in our lifetimes have we faced the opportunity to reimagine. The opportunity because the conditions are really laid bare in a way that we haven't faced before with this confluence of circumstances and some of the issues like climate change and what that is producing that we just haven't had to face in our lifetimes. So almost every organisation and board and decision making body is having to confront and learn and understand things in new ways in rapidly changing contexts and transitioning economies. We've talked about the challenges for capability. So I think of this as our 21st century moonshot, that the goals for this mission are really framed around many of the issues we've talked about tonight and that our colleagues at CSIRO have framed up for us around adapting to climate change, energy systems and resources that are leaner and cleaner and greener, 
meeting the health imperatives created by the pandemic and an ageing population and chronic disease and unmet need. Lessening and building resilience to geopolitical shifts, including the disrupted patterns of global trade and conflict, which is displacing millions. Harnessing this boom in digitisation and the tech revolution to get the best out of autonomous solutions without losing and indeed unlocking human potential and agency where that is the best resource that we've got. There's no doubt that there's going to be difficulties in these challenges and disruption, but we can do that. The gravitational pull of the now, as Damien explained, is really strong. But we do difficult. We dig things up out of the ground and we turn them into disposable plastics that we eat our takeaway food with. We can do difficult. As the former Bank of England Governor Mark Carney has said, achieving net zero actually requires the whole economy to transition. Every company, every bank, every insurer, every investor will have to adjust their business models. But doing so turns this existential risk into the greatest commercial opportunity of our time. And all of the most interesting problems, all of the most important problems, are essentially interdisciplinary. They're not linear geometry. They require the theory and they require the practice. My own experience has been that when we bring together people who with different backgrounds who think differently, we can achieve extraordinary things, things, as Ian said earlier, that we perhaps can't achieve on our own. We can also build legitimacy and, and collective advocacy. And as we've heard, so many organisations are facing similar problems. Let's solve the basics together, and then we still have plenty of room to differentiate in the market. We also know that we can learn from the deep expertise, and sometimes from people who haven't thought about the problems we are facing, but have thought about other problems. I love the story of NASA, who had been stuck on calculations about dark matter for 50 years. The person who helped them make a quantum leap forward worked with glaciers and spatial analysis of glaciers. What did they do? They asked the question of different people doing different things. What's often challenging, as we've heard and that Phil and Caron spoke to, is connecting the problems in business and industry to the people who actually are doing that work and to where there are the opportunities to tap into broad base of research and bring together the different components that might be needed in a particular context. It's difficult to find the space and the opportunities to bring together the kind of technical skills and data access to the evidence base and the research capacity fit for purpose at the right time. So to have a gateway into that that also creates the space to combine aspirational goals with clear analysis and practical action is rare and special indeed. Yet it's essential. I used to say to my teams, we need to create the most rigorous foundations we can because inevitably in our work, we have to ask people to take a leap of faith. So let's make sure they're jumping off something as solid as it can be. We need to understand the evidence and then go beyond our comfort zone to where it points us to go, where other things might not have worked and perhaps where nothing else will. That's the opportunity that we've got with initiatives like this and the institute that we're launching tonight, and it's why it's so exciting. The award-winning author, Arundhati Roy, painted an image of the pandemic as a portal. She wrote that historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one's no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. The institute might not be quite a TARDIS, and I'm not sure if it's a positive thing if you walk away thinking of Phil as the next Doctor Who. <laughs> But the way I see it, it can be a portal that enables us to better connect and navigate across boundaries. It can be a gateway between research and practice and real world impacts between one generation's view of the world and the next. It can be one of those spaces for collective problem solving, whether that involves breakthrough goals or identifying the kind of improvements that consistently applied can move forward the dial over time a catalytic platform with real world influence that can enable and accelerate developments of products and solutions, help to shift markets and policy, identify promising innovations that can grow, 
and design some things that we need to scale from the start. What we've seen in the launch this evening is also really important, and that's the commitment and willing involvement of people and organisations who are prepared and are making that step to problem solve together with shared purpose. Some things change the ecosystem just because they exist and enable people to come together in new ways and do things that wouldn't otherwise be possible. That becomes transformational. I'd love to see the Institute take its place as one of those. It was William Blake who said in 1803 that what is now proven was only once imagined. I encourage us all to imagine big about what this could be. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, the end of the formal part of the evening. Those who are staying for dinner can look forward to that. Uh, and those who are leaving us, thank you for being us being with us for this event this evening. And again, thanks to our panellists and to Phil for a terrifically inspiring conversation. All the best.